Great. Um, yeah, so my name is Nick Steinmetz. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, um, after having been a postdoc with Mateo and Kenneth Harris in London. Um, and I will tell you today um, about some uh, brain-wide recordings that we did with NeuroPixels probes. Um, it's Teo did these already, um, but I will um, hope to give you some sense of, um, you know, really what what we mean by brain-wide and what's uniquely you can achieve with the NeuroPixels probes relative to um, other recording devices. So I don't think I probably need to motivate this too much, but just to motivate a little bit um, why I think uh, you should care about recording from multiple structures in the brain. Here is a sagittal slice of a mouse brain where I've highlighted and labeled a few of the sort of key regions um, of the forebrain and midbrain um, from cortex, thalamus, basal ganglia, colliculus, hippocampus. And if we look at the anatomical, if we're trying to understand um, how the brain does any particular behavior and we, we look first at say the anatomical connectivity between these regions, I think the real challenge and the problem is that these anatomical connections form loops, that there are um, connections from, from one region to another and then back to that region or via some other path back. And so you get multiple um, interwoven recurrent loops. And um, because of those loops, you cannot uh, predict in principle what any particular structure is going to represent or what um, dynamics uh, the system is gonna have unless you measure it. Um, and so uh, we can, you know, certainly, and, and neuroscience has made many educated guesses about what brain regions are going to um, subserve some particular function um, or perform some particular computation. But ultimately, we're going to have to go look and see what, what pieces of information get, get propagated to what brain regions um, and what brain regions are, are necessary for which behaviors. So I think this is the real challenge that we're facing um, anytime we want to understand some cognitive or perceptual function that the brain does is where do you even start to look? How do you understand um, what interactions between and across these different regions might be critical for the behavior? And so that's where, um, as you've heard, NeuroPixels uh, came in. Um, and you know, I won't dwell on this because you heard all about it. Um, the NeuroPixels 1.0 device with um, 1,000 recording sites and 384 recording channels built in, um, densely spaced along the shank, um, enabled recording from uh, hundreds of neurons on a single probe simultaneously. And the sort of largest scale application that we did with this, I'm sure this video is not playing too well coming across on Zoom, um, but hopefully you can get um, a bit of the idea that what we did in this experiment was to insert eight different NeuroPixels probes into um, this awake mouse and record spiking activity across more than 3,000 uh, sites simultaneously. Um, this data went into this paper and you can actually um, download all the data um, for free if you want to play around with it. And so this, as you can tell, um, enabled us to sample neurons from multiple different brain regions all simultaneously. And the sort of small size and form factor of the NeuroPixels probe made it uh, possible to do this experiment without major uh, difficulties. And we're not the only ones who have been able to use NeuroPixels to uh, make recordings across the brain. Um, I'm highlighting here a few um, different studies that have taken a similar approach. Um, so this one is from Will Allen in the Dysarth Lab um, paper a couple of years ago. Um, this one is from the Allen Institute. Josh Siegel and Shashwan Jha are the first authors um, where they recorded across the visual system, visual cortex, visual thalamus, and of course hippocampus in between, um, uh, recording hundreds of neurons simultaneously. And I'm highlighting over here the work that, um, if you haven't heard about it yet, you will before too long. Um, the International Brain Lab is using NeuroPixels probes to record across hundreds of hundreds of different brain regions in the mouse. Um, so it's really the case that uh, you know the the point of this slide is that I want to communicate that it's really the case that it's not just one person with magic hands or one uh, special lab who can go out and use these to record data from lots of different brain regions. Um, there have been multiple successful applications in a few short years. And you can really take this technique into your own lab and do it too. And that's what this course will be about, of course. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, um, before I talk about the scientific work that I did with um, brain-wide recordings, I wanted to briefly um, give my own sort of two cents on the NeuroPixels 2.0 probes, which you've now heard about, um, which miniaturize and uh, make multi-shank the um, initial 1.0 design. So you can see that they're decreased in size by about a factor of three, both at the probe side and the head stage side. And um, 
additionally two probes can mount it on a single head stage. And so all of this makes them very small and lightweight, um, even relative to the already small Neuropixels 1.0 devices. Um, the, site's, the site geometry is a little bit different, and I'll talk uh, in the spike sorting section tomorrow about why, why, that, why that's the case. So these are the 2.0 probes. And the main point, um, one of the main points of 2.0 probes is that because they're so small and light and two of them can fit on a head stage, you have um, the ability to, with less than a, a one gram of implanted hardware, this, this two probes plus head stage uh, weighs about one gram. Um, you can implant two of these probes and record 768 channels simultaneously uh, in a freely moving mouse or in a chronically implanted mouse. Um, the data quality is still very high. Here's just an, a figure from our paper where we show some raw data with local field potentials and spiking data and some isolated single neurons with high quality um, waveforms and isolations. Um, so even though the probe was miniaturized, there was um, uh, no appreciable change in the data quality. And what this enabled was um, in data from Chetai Aiden and Seb Hessler's lab um, was this figure that Matteo showed you already where we could record from um, you know, over 6,000 sites in um, a freely moving mouse. And I think hopefully this text is clear, but you know, not all 6,000 of these sites were recorded simultaneously. As I mentioned, each probe has 384 uh, simultaneously recordable channels. So with two probes implanted, you can record 768 channels simultaneously. And therefore, um, Chatai recorded first you know, these, these um, orangish red spikes along with these cyan spikes and then switched the channel configuration to record these lighter orange spikes along with uh, these blue ones, um, et cetera. So not all these were recorded simultaneously. Um, but the power is uh, the power of the 2.0 is not just in the, um, the chronic implantation, um, but also in the fact that the four shanks allow you to much better sample um, certain brain regions than you otherwise would have. For instance, you can see that by implanting them across um, thalamus, we can record many more thalamic neurons than we would have gotten on a single probe itself, which, which was going to cover parts of thalamus, hippocampus, and cortex. Um, and so that's made this probe uh, really, really effective in my own lab uh, now that we're recording uh, with them in lots of different brain regions where sampling a sort of a 2D arrangement is uh, really effective to achieve high population counts. Okay, so that's just um, a quick additional blip about the um, Neuropixels 2.0 probes. And now I wanna tell you about the study that we did um, that um, in, in, Mate in Mateo's lab when I was a postdoc to um, try to understand something about the neural basis of visual perception. And to motivate this study, um, I wanna show this video, which is just a little video clip where we see sort of uh, some naturalistic behavior in, in a mammal. And in this case, the mammal is a deer, and you can see that the deer perceives some sort of stimulus and orients towards it. Um, there's, it's either an auditory or visual stimulus, we don't know, but there's an orienting behavior. And um, then there's this moment where the deer sort of tries to make a discrimination, uh, a life critical discrimination about whether the stimulus is something threatening um, or something that's not threatening and can be ignored. And, um, and you can tell that the deer momentarily tries to combine all the pieces of sensory information available to it to make that decision. And uh, I think what's also interesting about this video is that you can see that while this deer um, detects the stimulus and orients towards it, this other deer walks on without having detected the stimulus altogether. And so we can ask a couple of questions about the perceptual um, behavior that we just saw play out in this video. For instance, um, why are some stimuli perceived or detected and others are not? Why did the one deer detect whatever the stimulus was but the other didn't? Perhaps something to do with the internal state of the two deer. Maybe one of them was on the lookout and the other one wasn't. Um, and discrimination, how are multiple pieces of sensory evidence combined to make a choice? Um, in this case, the choice to either respond to the detected stimulus or ignore it. So these are the kinds of really basic questions that we set out to ask. And I think the real challenge is that these questions aren't about a brain region, right? The question I'm starting with here is not, what is the role of parietal cortex in discrimination? That's a valid question, you can ask it. Um, but here we're asking, you know, how do these processes work? And, and they undoubtedly involve multiple different brain regions. And so that's um, the, the challenge that we wanted to try to overcome was we didn't want to be stuck studying only the contribution of one brain region. We wanted to really look across the brain and try to understand multiple different brain regions, how they're working together um, to subserve these different perceptual and behavioral um, functions. So um, we designed a uh, contrast detection and discrimination task for mice. Uh, this was uh, led by 
Chris Burgess, um, who designed the basics of this task before I even joined the lab. Um, and in this task, the mouse is seated and surrounded by computer screens on which visual stimuli are shown. And the mouse has a wheel that it can turn clockwise or counterclockwise to indicate a decision about what it sees on the screens. And we reward the mouse with um, liquid rewards to uh, train it to do the task well and to motivate it um, to perform accurately. And head makes nice both so that we can control the visual stimuli precisely that the mouse sees, and also so that we can combine this with uh, large scale neural pixels recordings. So what the mice see on the screen in this task is um, a visual stimulus either on the left screen or the right screen. And if they see the stimulus on the left, they're supposed to turn the wheel clockwise. On the right, they're supposed to turn it counterclockwise. And when they turn the wheel, the stimulus is actually going to move with the turning of the wheel. And so another way to say what the mouse is trying to do is that it's trying to move the stimulus from the periphery into the center, um, whether it appears on the right or the left. And sometimes there can be two stimuli, and that makes this a contrast discrimination task. Um, the mouse has to pick the higher uh, of the two contrasts. Or there can be no stimulus present, um, in which case the mouse can still earn reward by holding the wheel still. And this allows us to also assess detection um, because we can um, uh, ask the mouse whether he detects any stimulus uh, versus detecting no stimuli. And they perform this task very well. Here's an example session where we can see um, on the right side of this axis trials in which stimuli were shown on the right side of the screen. And um, in orange dots, the probability that the mouse made a rightward choice, which uh, you can see that they did with high probability, um, which is correct. Um, likewise, when stimuli were on the left, on the left side of this axis, the mouse made high probability leftward choices and made these no-go responses primarily only when the contrast was zero. Of course, they do make perceptual errors, such as these missed trials when a stimulus was shown, but the mouse failed to respond. And those are errors of detection, which is what we want to study. Um, so maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip. This is the full behavioral uh, performance matrix, and you can check out the paper for more detail. Um, and then we combine the performance of this task with, um, with uh, NeuroPixels recording. So this is a video of a mouse. He's, you can see this wheel that the mouse's forepaws are resting on, and you can see him turning the wheel. And this is the visual stimuli that the mouse is seeing. And you can see the visual stimulus um, appears on one side or both. And then the mouse turns the wheel to bring the stimulus to the center screen, earning a reward. And at the same time, we're combining this with uh, NeuroPixels recordings. And so over here on the right, you can see the data um, from two different NeuroPixels probes. This one in the frontal cortex and another one in the back that goes through visual cortex, hippocampus, and thalamus. And um, you can see that we're able to record from uh, all of these sites, hundreds of uh, neurons simultaneously across multiple regions of cortex and subcortical areas. And um, this is the data that we then wanted to study and ask how uh, are different aspects of this visual detection and discrimination task um, encoded across the brain. So uh, Mateo showed you this figure before. This shows the recording locations that we had across, um, as Mateo said, 10 mice. And so you can see that you know, even in a relatively small number of subjects and a relatively uh, modest number of recording sessions, we were still able to cover a really significant portion of the mouse brain. And this is due to the fact that any, a single probe allows you to record across a four millimeter span of brain tissue. And so in those recording sessions, we were able to record, again, Mateo showed you this one, across, um, across frontal uh, cortex, motor cortex, and somatosensory cortex, across visual, primary and secondary visual areas, um, other parts of cortex like retrosplenial cortex. And then looking subcortically, we recorded across parts of the basal ganglia, here the striatum, substantia nigra, um, input and output nuclei of the basal ganglia. We recorded across the hippocampus, parts of thalamus, including visual uh, thalamic nuclei. And then um, finally, parts of the midbrain, um, including deep layers of superior colliculus, uh, midbrain reticular nucleus, zona inserta, um, and others. So, um, so um, what did we see when we looked at the neural activity in this task uh, from these brain regions? So here's just first a quick example neuron uh, where this neuron was located in deep layers of primary visual cortex. And this is the baseline that neuron recorded on the probe. We'll look at a lot more of these uh, as we go through the course. And this is the spiking activity of the neuron um, on different trials sorted by the contralateral stimulus. So when the stimulus was high contrast, this neuron responded robustly and with short latency. When the stimulus was medium and low contrast, the neuron also responded robustly, but with um, somewhat less uh, magnitude of response and later latency. And when there's no stimulus, this neuron was not responding. Um, so that's uh, great. That's pretty canonical. This is a, this looks like a pretty standard visual response. Um, what about across the rest of the brain? So to visualize that, I'm going to turn the activity from um, each neuron into a row in a color map. So this neuron going from low to high back to medium activity becomes a row in this color map that goes from white to black back to gray. 
And so each row here represents one neuron. And we can see that we're visualizing the activity of hundreds of neurons recorded from VisP, which is primary visual cortex. Um, and many, many neurons in VisP um, respond uh, robustly following visual stimulus onset. And so do, so too do neurons from uh, secondary visual areas um, listed here. But what about across the rest of the brain? So when we zoom out and look across the rest of the brain, we find that there are neurons in all these brain regions from frontal cortex and somatosensory cortex, uh, hippocampus from basal ganglia, thalamus, and midbrain all of these major structures of the mouse brain um, that are responding robustly following visual stimulus onset of this task. And so our question is, uh, what about this task is driving the activity of these neurons? Um, it doesn't have to be just the visual stimulus like um, we suspect that it is for this visual cortex neuron, um, but it could be aspects of the motor performance of the task or aspects of the decision-making that the mouse is undertaking. And so to tease that apart, we look at the different trial conditions that we have designed into this task. So um, here's an example neuron with its spiking responses um, shown again, but now broken up by different um, trial conditions, um, not just the stimulus conditions, but also the behavioral conditions. So here are um, contralateral and ipsilateral correct choices. And you can see this neuron response early on the contralateral ones, but not the ipsilateral ones. Here are trials where the same stimuli is shown, but when the mouse failed to detect and respond to the stimuli. Um, and this neuron is still responding, even in that case. And here are ones, uh, trials where, again, the same stimuli are shown, but now this is outside of the context of the task altogether. The mouse isn't doing any behavior whatsoever, not on this trial and not on um, trials around it. It's just in a passive state watching the stimuli. And again, this okay. neuron is still responding. And so this neuron, then we can conclude on the basis of comparing um, different conditions broken down by uh, both the perceptual state and behavioral state and also the motor behavior, we can conclude that this neuron is really driven by the visual stimulus, at least in this early part of the response. Here is some later part of the response that is more related to the motor behavior, um, but for this early part of the response, this neuron is uh, uh, characterized by a visual component to its response. And so then we can map that, um, that uh, network of visual, uh, visual areas across the brain, and we can see that um, this is largely what I call largely the classic visual pathway. That is, we have primary and secondary visual cortical areas. We have superficial layers of SC. We have um, some parts of the brain that receive direct projections from visual cortex, such as um, this part of frontal cortex and this part of the striatum. Um, we have visual thalamic nuclei. We have a couple of areas that aren't quite so expected. That is um, some of these midbrain nuclei. But largely speaking, this is the classic visual pathway. And so in some ways, this, um, this result is a sort of a positive control to say that um, we can effectively detect um, signatures that we expected to be in some of these areas. Um, but um, for, for this last slide that I want to show you, um, I, we, I'm going to show you the results from looking at a different correlate of the behavior that we observed and that we observed with a surprising distribution. So in this example neuron, this is just a, a different single example neuron, this time from the subiculum part of the hippocampus. In this example neuron, um, this neuron seems to respond on um, correct choice trials, but independent of which side the stimulus was on and which side the action um, was made to, whether it was a clockwise or counterclockwise turn of the wheel. Um, so these black dots here are the time when the wheel movement starts, and down here we're aligning to the time of the wheel movement onset. Um, and so you can see that this increase in activity is present on both orange and blue trials, contralateral and ipsilateral trials, um, and starts just before the wheel movement initiates. And uh, that activity is not present on miss or passive condition trials. So this neuron we would describe as being um, action encoding because it appears to respond uh, leading up to the time of action onset, but in a way that actually is independent of the particular choice that the mouse makes, uh, whether to turn the wheel clockwise or counterclockwise. And this encoding we were very surprised to observe was found in essentially every brain region we reported from. Um, we found some percentage of neurons that had this encoding um, reflecting the action initiation leading up to the time of action onset. And so this was really surprising to us because, you know, we thought uh, there was no particular reason for many of these brain regions to be involved in the task based on what we knew from the literature. Um, and in subsequent studies that you can read about um, uh, that we just published this year in eLife, um, we sort of tested the causality of, of the regions of cortex that are shown here to have this action encoding. And we find that this action encoding is not causally necessary in all places that it's um, observed. 
Um, but nevertheless, it's something that we do see in a task like this. And I think this is really a critical observation um, for understanding how to interpret data from many other tasks in the literature. For instance, um, if you're trying to interpret data from a go-no-go -no -go task in which the difference between um, detecting the stimulus or responding it um, or discriminating one option of a stimulus uh, versus not is to make an action versus not make an action. And um, we would predict on the basis of this result that you will see coding of that perceptual information across every brain region that you record from not just specific regions that are involved um, specifically in the performance of the behavior. Um, and so this was something that we gained we, um, from looking across many brain regions was the, sort of the knowledge that this was not a specific or localized signature, but was actually something widespread and distributed. And it turns out not causally relevant to perform the task. Um, so that was, I think, an important insight um, to reinforce Mateo's point that he made earlier about um, how you should really look at even the brain regions you aren't interested in because they're gonna tell you something interesting about how to interpret data from the brain regions you are interested in. Okay, so just to wrap up. Um, so as you've been hearing, um, these NeuroPixels CMOS probes um, have really enabled unpre unprecedented scale um, across the entire brain um, without losing that single spike, single neuron resolution. And um, in this work, we identified some principles that organize behavioral coding across the brain. And I didn't tell you about all of these, but I'm going to summarize them here. And you can read the paper if you're interested in learning more. So spontaneous and goal-directed actions are encoded globally. Um, but these representations are not all necessary for visual tasks. Um, I didn't tell you about the engagement, but cortex is suppressed during engagement and subcortical areas are activated. Choice is encoded um, in a restricted set of regions in the forebrain and the midbrain, and it's encoded differently in those two areas. So I didn't tell you about those. Um, that's just a teaser. You can go check out the paper if you want. So thanks um, very much to uh, Mateo and Kenneth, the, my two supervisors in this work. Also, Peter Zakahas was a super talented um, graduate student who uh, worked with me on most aspects of this project. And uh, definitely thanks to Tim and to IMEC and, um, and uh, all the members of the NeuroPixels Consortium. And I'm happy to take any questions. Cool. Um, we're now ahead of time, so we're planning to take a break in five minutes. So people people have had all sorts of questions. There's some questions for you, but, but mostly for Carolina. There's a question from Randall. Nick, can you get data this clean with non-head fixed mice? Um, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question to um, put to Yo um, when he talks, I think, on Wednesday, right? Um, because he'll, he'll compare different methods for making recordings from non-head fixed mice. And um, I think he'll be best positioned to sort of make that direct comparison. Um, I will say that in my personal experience, um, like the figure that Mateo showed you from chronic recording, a chronically recorded mouse in um, the NeuroPixels 1.0 paper, the recordings in that case were um, pretty close to as clean as uh, acute, although um, not exactly the same. Um, so, so in my experience, it's pretty close, yeah. Okay. The will be better placed. Uh, there is a question from Mohebat, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, did in any of the trials you record from the cerebellum, or are there any other studies that have done so? Yeah, great. And no, we did not record from the cerebellum in my uh, study. That's why I uh, cut it right off of the maps of the brain that I showed you. Um, so apologies to all the cerebellum fans out there. Um, but uh, I mentioned. Uh, earlier, the International Brain Lab, who has undertaken a study to um, to um, use a similar recording modality, uh, the NeuroPixels probes in acute head fixed mice, um, but with a somewhat even more interesting behavioral task and uh, with a much, much broader and denser sampling strategy across the brain. And so that will be the source of uh, many cerebellum recordings in a task very much like this one. Okay. And there's a question from Thomas. With the high temporal resolution of neuropixels, can you infer any directionality in these global signals between brain regions? Yeah, great. Thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, so we uh, did not. Um, so for the for the choice signal specifically, um, which I just alluded to at the end, we um, tried really hard to determine a timing difference, a latency difference between um, one region and another. And the two the two ways we did that were one was a population decoding. Um, which did not reveal any difference in the time course of the population decoding of the, um, the choice related information. And the other was um, with a method based on canonical correlation analysis to sort of do a cross correlation between populations of neurons. Um, and uh, you'll have to look at the paper or contact me afterwards if you want to talk more about those methods. Um, but the short answer is 
um, we were able to determine timing differences between some areas, but not specifically in the choice related information. Okay. Um, so that's, that's all I can say right now. So Carolina has, has been typing away answering questions about grounding. Do you want to tell us how you did the grounding in your experiments? Yeah, so I used the strategy that um, Carolina mentioned was uh, a common one, which is um, shorting the external reference and the ground, and then connecting that, in this case, to a saline bath over the head of the mouse. Um, I also, in some, some of the recording um, uh, agar made with saline um, to embed the um, the ground wire. Um, and you'll talk about this. Silver chloride wire embedded in the agar. And you'll talk about this when we talk about practicalities. Yeah, I think we'll describe it more. Although, uh, to be honest, uh, Carolina's description of the referencing was as good as you will get. So, yeah. Awesome.